Good morning. Um, let me start by thanking the conference organizers for uh, including my paper on this program. Uh, I've been to a few conferences that have had the stated goal of bringing together academics and policymakers, uh, regulators, practitioners, uh, but I think, at least in my experience, uh, this here has uh, been an exceptional um, uh, circumstance here where this goal has been able to be achieved uh, very well. So, uh, having said that, I'm Taylor Begley. I'm from just down the street at WashU here in St. Louis. This is joint work with Amiatosh Pernanandam, who's at Michigan, so right down the street from our uh, community bank discussant, uh, Peter, so you can take up any issues with Amiatosh. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, this, uh, the title of this paper is Color and Credit, uh, Race Regulation and the Quality of Financial Services. So, you know, community uh, pro uh, consumer protection, I think we'll all agree, uh, is an important focus of regulators across uh, a variety of places in the economy. Okay, you can think about the FTC uh, in terms of maybe the drugs that we take, uh, the regulated drugs that we take, uh, the FDA is important, uh, and the, the DOJ for certainly maybe making sure that there's not too much market power uh, in certain uh, sectors of the uh, economy. Uh, and banking in the financial services industry uh, is not unique from some of these, con uh, or exempt from some of these concerns. Uh, there have been recent debates about the fiduciary rule. Uh, we know the well-publicized scandal uh, with Wells Fargo and the accounts being opened. We have uh, various anecdotes uh, and empirical evidence leading up to the crisis of widespread uh, fraud. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, very little is known, I think, about who is bearing the brunt of some of this potential uh, misbehavior, okay? And so the area that Amiatosh and I are looking at is mortgage lending, okay? And so if we live in a friction, frictionless world where there's no market power, no information asymmetry, uh, no potential distortions from uh, regulatory regimes, of course, there's no real need for consumer protection. Uh, of course, no one lives in that world, uh, and we are concerned about the potential distortions that can come about as a result of these uh, market failures, okay? Typically, what we have focused on in the past is, potentially if you're thinking about the market power story, is you may be worried about uh, restricted quantities, okay? So maybe not enough credit is being extended, or you may be worried about higher prices. So even on a risk-adjusted basis, uh, you know, the prices are higher than what a competitive market uh, uh, would determine. Uh, we also may worry about the populations, different populations receiving different treatment. Uh, and what we try to do in this paper is certainly quantities and prices are very important and they are a focus of a lot of the regulations that are written. Uh, but what we're trying to do is sort of uh, bring a third leg to this stool and provide a first look, uh, look at some product quality in financial services and banking. Okay? Now, quality. Uh, this is a very difficult uh, thing to define, okay? Quality is uh, inherently uh, subjective. Uh, it can be very difficult to measure. And so in our research here, we're basically uh, going to be looking at mortgage quality uh, dilutions in the form of ex post complaints, okay, about uh, a consumer's experience. So as far as data, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was a baby uh, I know that you all know well that was born out of uh, Dodd-Frank, has collected a nice database of complaints that go across a wide variety of financial services. So it, it, it includes mortgages, credit cards, um, savings accounts, debt collection services, and a variety of other things, but we're, we're really focusing um, on mortgages. So what we have is about 175,000 complaints, okay, uh, over nearly the entire United States, so 16,000 zip codes, uh, from 2012 through 2016. And what we're going to be trying to do is basically ask, are these complaints, are these instances of lower quality systematically related to factors that are uh, demographic? And then we're going to look ab uh, about what is the role of regulation in all of this. Okay? So just an example of one data point. So uh, this was pulled soon after the headlines came out about Wells Fargo last year. Our data will include a date, what is the product? Here it's a conventional mortgage. Uh, who is the company that the complaint is against? Here it's Wells Fargo, and we also have geographical information. So in this example, it's, it has a customer that says, look, I, I was going to refinance. Uh, I let uh, the bank know that I was behind and that I'd filed for bankruptcy a while back, and they said, no problem, okay? I've got to pay for this, uh, this fee to check my credit, um, and I'm also going to have to pay for a, uh, an appraisal. So I'll go ahead and I pay them and do that. 
uh, and they never received even the appraisal, which is a large portion of that charge. Uh, and then they denied the application based upon some of these factors that I had already told them about, okay? They go and they want the money back for the appraisal that was never even charged, uh, never even called for. They can't get a return on their call. Uh, and then they finally ask, uh, I think rhetorically, what is Wells Fargo doing with all this extra money that's not going to my appraisal? Okay. And so this is just one data point. We have 180,000 of these. Um, and uh, I won't take you through all of them. Uh, so um, what we're trying to do, again, is see if these complaints are going to be systematically related to things like income, education, and race, okay? Surely there's going to be some randomness in these complaints. Some are going to be frivolous. Some are going to be more serious. But if, uh, what we want to make sure that we can look at is, is there a systematic component to this that's related to things like, for example, sophistication uh, that you may think be proxied for in income and education, okay? Now, we had to be very careful in this analysis because we want to take care of some other systematic drivers of complaints. For example, how many mortgages are in that zip code? Okay, or what is the population of folks that are out there that are applying for mortgages? You may also be worried about uh, regional differences in economic conditions, and so we're gonna be able to control for uh, the three-digit zip code level economic conditions. Okay, so above and, uh, above and beyond those factors, what is driving variation um, in these complaints about poor service quality or mis-selling? Um, and so just looking across this graph, the way that you can read these numbers is a standard deviation change in the left-hand side variable, so income, education, and minority population, relating to a percentage change in the left-hand side variable. So here you can see a standard deviation decline in the area's income leads to 10% more claims of fraud or mis-selling or bad customer service. If we look at low education areas, we see something very similar. Lower education uh, correlates strongly with more complaints and more dissatisfaction. And then third, as we look at the, the, the minority population there, uh, statistically this is still very strong and economically it's two to three times larger. Higher minority populations leads to higher complaints. Okay? Of course, you might look at these three items and say, well, maybe these three things are, are correlated. So if we put them in somewhat of a horse race, you can see that the minority population is a real driving force that's relatively unaffected by the educational attainment of the area or the income of the area. So above and beyond education uh, and income, this is the effect of the minority population. Now, if we want to take that minority population and take it apart even a little bit further, that's what we'll do here graphically. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to compare bucket by bucket, going from the least minority population, so 0 to 20 percent is a minority, 20, 40, 60, 80, all the way up through to the most minority population zip codes, which is 80 to 100 percent, you can see a pretty stark pattern here, that it's moving up monotonically, and especially as you get into that right tail, where 80 to 100 percent of the people living in the zip code are uh, non-white population, you can see that almost twice as many complaints are coming from that area. And again, this is over and above any factors that relate to education, income, uh, number of mortgages, and what have you. Okay? And so, first part of the talk, lower income, lower education, and higher minority population are associated with more complaints. Now, there are some concerns that we have, okay? First of all, we can't observe true quality. We only have one measure uh, of what we view as quality. We can't observe true uh, consumer preferences, and there's always this thing in the background that maybe uh, some of you have already come to is, is this just a complainer effect? Are we just picking up areas where they, uh, where the people that live there would just complain about uh, the mail coming in late, uh, and the cable bill is too high, and all of these other things that maybe are unrelated to their mortgage experience, okay? Well, we take that very seriously, and keep in mind that this is above and beyond any effects that are going on for uh, local uh, sort of regional economic conditions. But another thing that we try to do to sort of tease out our complaints from just a baseline complainer effect is we have other databases that look at complaints, for example, with the FCC. And so if we put that into our analysis and try to use that as basically a baseline of sort of marginal propensity to complain, we can include that and the effects that we find are virtually uh, unaffected. We also include in our analysis things like the home price changes. So we're not just going to be picking up areas where there was a big drop in home prices or where there was a large increase in foreclosures. So our results are above and beyond all of that. 
So after establishing those facts, uh, we want to move farther and think about, you know, what might be the underlying drivers, okay, maybe what can be done uh, if we don't like the way that these facts look. And so one thing that we can look a little bit closer at uh, is regulation. Now, fortunately, Eway uh, did a lot of the legwork for me in talking about the importance of the CRA, uh, so I won't spend too much time other than to say that this is going to be focusing on providing access to credit to low and moderate income neighborhoods, okay? It says here to provoke promote the availability of credit and other services to low and moderate income communities. Okay, now what is a low and moder uh, uh, to moderate income community? Well, it depends on where you are. It depends on where you are. So the way that this is going to be defined is on a census tract by census tract basis that says if the median family income in this area is below 80% of the MSA level income, then you're gonna be designated uh, as a focus area, a low to moderate income area. And so what that does, what's nice for me as an econometrician uh, to be able to tease out some of these effects is I'm going to end up with observably identical areas, even on income, okay, where one area is going to have this CRA focus and another area will not. So just to illustrate what I'm talking about, let's, uh, let's talk about Texas. And so Dallas here in the blue, what I've plotted here is um, the census tract incomes across the entire Dallas MSA. Okay, that's the blue line, that's the density of that. So you can see some are low, some are high. Here what we have is the median income is about 69,000. Okay, we take 80% of that and we get 55,000. Everybody to the left of that blue line is an LMI uh, census tract. Yeah? Okay. Now we pull up San Antonio, uh, the red line, where the median income is about 58,000. All right, so we take 80% of that, that's 46,000. Everybody to the left of that red dashed line is going to be uh, an LMI uh, census tract there too. So the nice thing for comparison is, hey, I can look at a $50,000 track in both places, okay? And the argument that, I'm uh, that some of these results are gonna stand and fall on is do you believe me when I say that this $50,000 track in uh, Dallas is gonna be comparable to a $50,000 track in San Antonio? The only differences in these two I will claim, or the main differences between these two I'm going to claim, is that one is having this regulatory pressure and the other is not. So what we do is we basically find sort of twin zip codes uh, for each zip code that is facing uh, this extra pressure to lend, okay, and we're going to match on things like the number of mortgages, the income, the education, things I've already talked about, the geography, uh, and the local house price changes to get as close a match as I can, all right? And again, my assumption is the only systematic difference between these two is the regulatory pressure to lend in these areas. All right? And so the baseline result in comparing sort of the treatment, the CRA focus area to the observably identical counterpart is we find that 28% more complaints, uh, instances of this fraud, mis-selling, and poor uh, customer service, what, uh, however you'd like to say it, 28% uh, more in these targeted areas that are observably identical. All right? Further, if I can uh, constrain this to make sure that I am within sort of $5,000, so there is a little bit of noisiness in the matching, but if I constrain my matching criteria to say, look, you have to be within $5,000 of one another, still we're getting estimates of 20 to 30 percent more complaints uh, for the regulatory target areas. Then, if I continue with this baseline matching strategy, but then I also match on race, because I don't just want to be sorting the same variable in two different ways, race and then CRA focus. I want to know if there is independent effects. So if I also match on race, so now I'm doing my $50,000 track in Dallas with 10% uh, minority population, uh, with a similar one in San Antonio, and that does not kill the results. So over and above any racial issues here, uh, we see about a 20% increase uh, in the number of complaints for these target areas. And then lastly, I want to say, is this effect differential for high minority areas versus low minority areas? So I do the same matching scheme, okay, and then I'm going to look at areas that are below median minority population and above median minority population, and I find for the low minority areas, the effect is there, but it's somewhat negligible, okay? Zero to five percent more complaints. In some specifications, that's not statistically different from zero, all right? But then when I flip and I look at the high minority areas, I see a very uh, economically substantial effect of about 40 uh, to 50 percent higher effect of the CRA re uh, regulation in minority zip codes, okay? 
So at the end of the day, I think we can uh, all agree that consumer protection uh, is going to be a paramount concern, and it's something that uh, we uh, can agree that is an important thing to, to deal with. Uh, you know, we are just trying to document that some of the key characteristics, just establish some facts, okay, that it's low income education and high minority areas that are facing uh, this, this more poor quality. And it seems that the current regulation, if anything, uh, is exacerbating uh, some of these issues. And so lastly, let me uh, do, do a similar thing to the other authors here on the panel is I don't want to overstep my bounds or overclaim. So what can we say and what can't we say? Well, what we can't say is CRA is always and everything everywhere a bad thing. Surely there are probably some benefits that come from it. The main thing that we're trying to highlight here is there's a certain area, uh, a certain uh, measurable outcome that comes along with this that needs to be considered, and namely that is sort of the quality of the services that are being uh, provided and how this uh, regulation might diminish those services. So, thank you.